Hi, I'm Lee Harris Stevens, and I don't play vibes, but some of my best friends play vibes, and I've been listening to complaints about vibes for more than two decades. Since I've been making marimbas and designing them, I've been hearing from my friends who play vibes that I should make a vibraphone. So around 2004, I started on that path, and I hired an engineer to help me with it, because I'm not a trained engineer. And uh, that fellow worked for us for about a year or so, and then quit, and said that many of the ideas that I had about how to make a better vibraphone were really impossible. Temporarily gave up, but then we re hired another uh, engineer, Roger Clark, Swiss engineer, and Roger said, hmm, let me think about those things a little bit. And after a while, he came back, and we started to work very, very hard on the Love Vive. And in 2008, we showed a prototype of that instrument. By 2009, we had a real instrument on the market. We had several patents, and uh, the Love Vive has been on the market since then. Um, this instrument here is not a Love Vive. It's an Omega Vive. Totally different instrument. Because here's what's hap what happened was a lot of vibe players listened to the love vibe, and while they loved all of the work that we had done to make it quiet, versatile, tunable resonators, improve the dampening, it was squeak free, etc., uh, they said it's not suitable for their professional work where they have to pack up a vibe quickly, put it in the car, go to a gig, set it up. So they were asking me to make a very portable uh, vibe without the squeaks and without the dampening problems. and Etc. So uh, after the Love Vibe was on the market for a while, we started on this project, the Omega Vibe, and that's what today's video is about. It's about this instrument, the Omega Vibe. And uh, the main differences are that the Love Vibe has manual control of the vibrato through the damper pedal. You can do crescendos and diminuendos, add vibrato only when you want it and need it through the pedal. And the Omega Vibe is a little bit more traditional vibrato in that it has a motor with a speed control. The way we get the vibrato is very different, you'll see that, but it's basically motorized vibrato, and of course you can buy either instrument without any vibrato, and uh, just if you choose not to have a, a vibrato as part of your sound. So just one caveat, we're here in the Malatek factory, it's not going to be a high production, uh, beautiful presentation. Um, we're just here in the final inspection room, and we asked some big time producers like Spielberg and um, George Lucas and some other people to do the video on this instrument and they were, they were busy, so we're just sort of doing it ourselves. So I hope you put up with some uh, rough edits and uh, I think we'll cover all the information that we need to cover and uh, that's it for the introduction. Okay, so this is the box that the Omega Vibe is shipped in. When it comes to you, uh, you've got to get the box open. Now, the very best way to do that, what I would recommend, is to get a pair of pliers and pull out all of these staples here. Now, be very careful. It's only common sense, but the staples are very sharp, so just be very careful pulling them out. This box was not opened uh, properly. It's a reject box, and it was slit with a razor blade. That's okay, but probably not the preferred way to open up this box. Once you get it open, I'll just quickly go through some of the contents here. This is actually empty, but ordinarily that would be the sharp keys in there. Um, you've got a bag of stuff. Now, as they say, you know, in, in real life, it might be slightly different than this. It might have shifted. Contents may have shifted. There's the buckle, um, the uh, strap for the damper pedal. Here is your power supply for the vibrato motor. Here's a repair kit with washers and felt pieces and so forth, nuts and bolts and screws and allen keys. In here, you've got a tuning stick. This tuning stick is to get you back to around 70 degree settings in your resonator tuners in case you get messed up and lost and don't know where you are. Uh, packed over here is the damper pedal wrapped in glad wrap here so that you can uh, use it for a little bit or we can, in final inspection, we use it and we don't actually leave any footprints on it, so we wrap it up. And then we've got a uh, manual in here that has your warranty card, very, very important. Send back in your warranty card and you get a free set of mallets of your choice. And this will give you some of the care and feeding information, some of which will be covered here in this video, and uh, other tips and information that won't be covered in the video. So hold on to that for the life of the instrument. Uh, incidentally, with this box, if you open it carefully, 
You could use this box at some point in the future, perhaps, repack it, ship the instrument to Europe, South America if you're American, uh, if you're in, in Europe, you could ship it anywhere in the world, really, in this box. So that's another reason that you want to preserve the box if you possibly can. Now, what else do we have in here? Let's uh, move this aside. And let's talk about the other things that are in here. Um, can't get it out right this second, but the next thing in here, I'm going to tilt this forward so you can see, this next box uh, are the two sets of resonators, sharps and naturals. Next to it, I don't know if you can see in there, here, I'll tilt it all the way down. Over there, those are the other set of keys. I took out before, I think it was the sharps, so those would be the naturals or vice versa. And then this is the actual heart and leg assembly right here, and it's taped closed. Uh, yours might be stable, closed, depends, but uh, basically that's the contents of the whole box. Okay, this is the resonator box. Within this box, you'll also find the vibrato wings, if in fact you ordered a vibrato with your instrument. Uh, that would be an Omega. If you ordered it without vibrato, it would be an Omina. Sorry about that, but that's the name. Um, so the white stuff is just a film covering for protective, um, it's a protective surface, and you can grab the edge and peel that all off, and then it'll look like that. It'll look gloss black once you peel off the protective uh, coating on there. And you'll see on there there's some felt pads and some polyethylene uh, slippery surfaces and a couple of uh, nylon bushings. Set them aside. We'll use those later. Then in the box, we've got the two sets of resonators. Uh, I'm going to pull the first set out. This happens to be the naturals and the dead giveaway. Pardon me, don't be offended, but you know it's got all the plugs, so it's going to be naturals. Believe it or not, once in a blue moon, a customer calls up and says, wait, some of the resonator plugs are missing, and it turns out they've got the naturals and the sharps swapped out for some reason. You can see in here, these are the tunable resonator plugs. Uh, you can get supplemental information on this at some other places on the Mostly Marimba site. Some um, materials, uh, some videos by Tom Burrett and by Joe Locke, and um, I think Tony Maselli probably has one also now. But in any event, this is the way you tune. You loosen this about a turn or a turn and a half, slide it in or out, and even a millimeter will make a huge difference, particularly up in this register. Down here, you might have to you know, go two or three millimeters or the equivalent of like an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch to make a significant difference. But the way they're shipped, they're shipped uh, for a, uh, with that tuning stick that we showed you earlier for about 68 to 70 degrees. If you get much beyond 70, 172, 73, you might want to retune. If you get much below 68, you might want to tune also to bring the volume of the instrument up. So the tuning stick will always enable you to get back to ground zero. You just put the tuning stick in there and the line should align with the edge. Now you see also this little thing here. Um, there are two of these on each set of resonators. These are wing guides. And not everybody needs them, but if you're a real heavy player and you really hit the instrument hard, you can get the wing to start to vibrate. Or if you play a rhythm uh, just on one note, uh, really, really loudly, you can get the wing to start to vibrate. And this prevents the wing from actually tapping uh, on the resonator. So if you're a, a medium player, light player, normal player, you can actually pull these out if you want, uh, or just leave them in, whatever you think. In this box, we've got the harp, folding legs, and the bottom crossbar. So I'm going to take that out and set it aside for now right next to the resonators and the other parts. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Okay, we're gonna tilt this up just to show you what's inside there. And um, you can take it out by yourself, just pull it out, or have a friend hold the box down while you slide it out. Here we go. Before we set the instrument up on its legs and unfold the legs, 
I thought it would be good to get some close-ups of some of the features here that will be very difficult to see because they'll be underneath once the instrument's set up. In no particular order, uh, check out the motor. The motor is about one quarter the size and of course about four times the price, unfortunately, of most traditional vibe motors. It's a DC motor that will work anywhere in the world. Uh, you don't need to get a different motor if you're traveling to Europe from the United States or to the United States from Europe. Uh, all you need is the proper plug on the other end. So uh, that little DC motor, it's a very strong little motor. And um, that's it right here, just this little tiny thing. It's a little bit, it's maybe about two bonbons big. This uh, dial here will enable you to uh, rotate the motor in order to change the tension on this uh, drive belt here, on this timing belt. So you probably won't use that, but if you need to for some reason, you would loosen that and you can, you can move the motor around slightly to put more or less tension on the, uh, on the drive timing belt. These are the two spring towers. Uh, in our opinion here at Malatech, you just can't have a professional vibe with one spring tower. It's just impossible. One spring in the middle, the, the damper bar is floating around like this and it's going to come up sometimes this way, sometimes that way. So we have two spring towers and then this little gizmo right here, this is the dial or the knob that will enable you to put more or less tension on the spring tower. And one is for the high end here, one is for the low end there. You can just reach under the instrument uh, when it's completely set up and adjust that. We'll talk more about that once the instrument's set up. You got your four locking casters. Right now, when, it, when the instrument comes to you, the legs are going to be Velcroed in position uh, because the tension on these is really not quite enough. The legs could open when you're carrying it if you don't have the Velcro strap here. So just take off the Velcro straps that are holding the whole thing together so that you can assemble the instrument and save those, obviously, because you use those over and over again every night for the gig. And um, we'll talk soon about setting up uh, the instrument, but I just want to tell you what these knobs are for. Um, this lower knob, lower once it's set up, that's going to be the lower knob, that's for height adjustment. And there's two, of course, one on either side of the instrument on that end and two on that end. And you'll loosen those and that'll operate the height adjustment. And the next one up is strictly just for setup and breakdown, and it is the knob that tightens the leg assembly into place. So in order to set up the instrument, you'll have to have all four of these loosened so that the legs can swing out. And that'll be the next uh, segment that we talk about. Um, one more thing I'm going to show you that before we set this up, we're going to have to cut off. There's a protective piece that we ship this. Normally there are more than one strap here, but you have a protective strip here that we're going to have to snip this off and take off the cardboard. And that's just to protect the uh, damper assembly here and keep compression on the damper bar so that the damper bar doesn't pop off the springs or something like that in travel. And that's pretty much it uh, for the undercarriage of the instrument. So now we've put the instrument with the legs down, bar posts facing up, and we're going to show you how to actually set the instrument up. Uh, one thing is when you first set up the instrument for the very first time, the damper bar will have a piece of corrugated of some sort uh, attached to it to protect it, keep a little tension on the damper bar. You'll probably have more than one cable tie, but I'm just going to show you here. We can just take a scissor and we can just cut that out. Don't cut anything else, but do take out the, the cable tie, throw that away, and now you've got this corrugated piece and you can throw that away because you won't need that anymore. Okay, so now we've got to get ready to swing the legs out. In order to swing the legs out, four of the leg knobs have to be loose. We did in the last segment, that's the proper knob and there are four of those, so you want to make sure those are loose. Um, and so what I've done here is I've, loose, I've pre loosened them. Just go like this, just lean over here, make sure it's loose, make sure each one of these is loose, 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 okay? Now when I tilt the instrument up on edge, I'll be able to swing, well, look, it, it goes automatically. <laughs> you can swing the legs out. But let me explain that when you do this, um, maybe you can get a close-up of this little flat mechanism here. This flat, is what's going to support the instrument before I tighten anything up. I'm going to swing that out and that flat is going to hit 
this flat. So I lift up here, I swing that out, okay, and now I'm going to move the legs into the frame so that the legs go down and they, they, they land on that flat. Now once they land on the flat, I can tighten this knob to temporarily hold the legs sort of rigid. It'll be enough to get it up on the, up on the feet. So I swing it out, move it down, and then I snug up that little knob. Okay, and now I've got it sort of temporarily stabilized. And then what I'll do is I'll grab the instrument, lift it up, and put it up on its feet, just like that. Okay, now that I'm up in this position, the instrument isn't really stable side to side completely until the crossbar is installed on the bottom. But it's, it's you know, hands-free, you can leave it like that. Don't bump it hard because it could go to one side or the other. But what we have to do to stabilize it is now we have to tighten the knobs that are holding the legs. So we want to make sure that it's all the way down. And then just that one we tightened when it was still down below. And now I'm going to get this one, the top one on the player high side, I'm going to tighten that down. The player low side, I'm going to tighten that knob, just snug it up here, just so that we get a little bit more stability out of the legs. And then this one over here might be a little, yeah, that loosened up a little bit, so we're going to snug that one. Now we have significantly more stability to the frame. Again, it's not perfect until the crossbar goes in, but we've got a lot of stability now. Next thing I would say is we want to unlock the casters and put them in the proper position. This is something that's not fully appreciated by vibes players, but you can get a much more stable instrument if you lock all the casters to the outside position. So you're widening the base of the instrument as much as possible. It'll be a much more stable instrument if, if it gets locked in that direction. So unlock it, spin them to the outside position, Relock it. Now I've gotten an extra three or four inches worth of stability on that end. Ditto over on this end. Should unlock that, move it to the outer position, lock it, unlock, move it to the outer position, relock it. And now we have even a more stable instrument. Our next step is going to be to install the crossbar. But for now, the instrument is stable. It's okay. Again, don't smash into it, don't knock it, but it's pretty stable without the crossbar. The next step is to install the crossbar onto the frame. Now, I'm going to take one brace here and move it over towards the Malatech logo. Obviously, the Malatech logo faces the audience. Take the other brace, move it towards the low end. And then, just hold those in position and I'm going to put it underneath the frame. And I'm going to set that down on the base of the crossbar. Now, Here's where you can either get very frustrated or learn how to do this perfectly. We have a video online of Joe Locke doing this, and uh, the two takes that he took before the one that's on, online, they're each about maybe two minutes or so. The next time he took a minute off the, uh, the time, next time he took another minute, eventually he did this, I think it was a minute and 21 seconds to get to this point. We've spent 10 minutes so far together, or I don't know how, how much time, but to get to this stage, with that crossbar on can be as little as a minute and a half once you know what you're doing. So what we do now is we've got to make sure that the frame is square and that this notch is right next to that bolt because it won't obviously won't go on the instrument's not square if that notch is not next to that bolt and vice versa over here likewise at the top end of the instrument that notch has to be right next to that bolt. In order to do that, you can see the low end legs are a little bit splayed out to the outside. So I've got to pull that in and get it aligned. Now it's very close to proper alignment, and I can take the instrument and I can sway it just an inch or so in either direction to get that alignment correct. And once it's correct, you'll see if that's correct on that side and that's correct on this side, then that just popped right in perfectly. And if this is aligned properly, then that pops in perfectly. You don't have to make so much noise, you can do it quieter than that, but for the drama of it, I just smack it with my hand. Once that's in, 
Then bring up the brace, get it into that slot, and notice that on the brace, if you can get a close-up of this, that brace is countersunk there. So when I tighten that knob up, it goes into the countersink and holds it very, very firmly. So I get that up in here, there, and then I tighten that brace. For now, it doesn't have to be super tight. If you want to go back and snug it up later, that's fine. Ditto over here, Let's swing it up in here, bring that brace in. I have these unnecessarily loose for this demo. You wouldn't have to turn it five turns the way I just did. You could just leave it just a half a turn loose. Once that's in, I then snug this up. I snug this up. And again, that whole process to get to this position, uh, Joe Locke did on his third try without all the chatter from me. He did that in a minute and 21 seconds, I think it was. Here's your pedal. Let's memorize the position of these parts, or you'll have to go back and see the video again. But this top one is the locking knob. Unscrew that, take that off, put it aside. The next one determines the tension of the pedal for how easily or hard it's going to swivel. That puts pressure down on the pedal. Let's take that off, just spin that off. Okay. Set that aside. Down here you've got a lock washer and a low density polyethylene washer. We got those two. Set those aside. Now, we could have put this pedal on when the instrument was on its side. Um, and when you, once you know where you're going to position the pedal, you'll leave it on when you travel. You're not going to take it off, but this is just for the first setup. For now, we're going to use the center hole. Uh, the Omega Vibe and the Love Vibe have the ability to move the pedal left and right for your personal taste. If you're playing here all the time uh, and you're right footed, you might want to have the pedal instead of in the center hole, you might want to try it over here or over here. But for now, we're going to put it in the center hole. If you didn't already install the pedal when the crossbar was off, what you could do, tilt it forward and put that up into the hole here. And just set it back down on its wheels. And we've got it. Okay? Then, this washer goes on there, the polyethylene washer, and then the lock washer goes on there. Next thing, the four knob gizmo goes down, and this will determine how easily or how hard it is for the pivot to go. And that will lock down, and it'll, this, this thing, once it's locked against the lock washer, it won't pivot. Okay? Then you take this, and you lock it in whatever tension position you want. I want a little bit of tension on here, that's what I would want. Some people want to have this rigidly always in the same position, so then you would turn down this a little bit tighter. And then once you have the setting that you want, then you put this on. Just like that. And then I tighten it against the one below. And then that locks it in place with the same tension. So next we're going to install the pedal damper strap, but I just want to show you underneath here where it's going to go. If you see underneath here, this is the pull bar. The pull bar is attached to the damper bar, and it distributes the load of the pulling across the damper bar. Most vibraphones pull in one central place, and eventually the damper bar is going to bend in the center, and you're going to get uneven dampening. So we distribute that load, and that damper bar enables you also to move the strap really to any position on the instrument so that you can adjust the pedal left or right and still be pulling anywhere on, that, uh, on the damper pull bar. Now the strap comes in the plastic bag. I've cut it open the plastic bag. I take out the strap. There's the strap. And it's a matter of taste which way you do it. I like to put the male member on top, coming down into the female member. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to reach over the front. Now again, this is just the first time you set up the instrument. You'll leave it with the instrument from this point on uh, when you go out to a gig. But I just go over the top of the damper pull bar, and that's installed now. What I have to do now is, underneath here, I'll run this female part of the uh, buckle through the clutch that's on the pedal, and I just attach it. 
And that's it, that's how fast it is to set up. At the end of the gig, all I do is I unhook it, and in order not to lose it, lose it rather, I just attach it and it just stays there with the pull bar. You can actually use that to strap the legs in place too if you want. So let's reinstall that. Boom, done. Next thing is you can adjust the height of the pedal just with the strap. I don't have to really explain that too much, but you're just gonna either shorten or lengthen the strap to get it to the right height. So one more quick feature I want to show you here that's related to the strap is this clutch assembly here, part of our patented dampening system. So what it enables you to do is to very quickly change the height of the pedal, almost instantaneous actually. I loosen that knob and then I can just slide this clutch either forward to lower the pedal or back towards my foot to raise the pedal. But it has another function and that is that it changes the ratio of pedal motion to damper bar motion. The closer I have that clutch to where my toe is, the faster the damper bar releases the bars relative to how far up to press the pedal. And the closer I go towards the audience, towards the crossbar here, if I move it back this way, then I've slowed down that motion and that ratio. So now I've got less damper bar motion per amount of pedal motion. That's important because some players would like to have the damper bar released like an on-off switch, very fast response. Other players like to use this progressive dampening where they taper the ends of notes and release very, very uh, gradually. In fact, if you want more of an on-off switch, we can supply you with a different type of damper, a more traditional felt damper. Happy to do that if you, what you want is really an on-off switch instead of what we consider this to be, which is like a dimmer switch. Before I put the resonators in, I thought it would be easier for you to see. I, I want to show you how the vibrato system operates. Uh, and you can see the timing belts here. They're not fragile. You can see I'm messing with them like this, no problem. They're not going to break. They're used on uh, you know, heavy duty equipment to uh, control the positions of things. So you don't have to worry about that. But I want to show you the alignment. Notice that these two pins for the sharps now are facing this way and the two, two pins for the naturals are facing that way. They should always be pretty much opposite one another to get the wings to produce vibrato at the same point. Now you could whack them out if you want. If you want to do some special effects and have the sharps and the naturals at different times, you can do that. But generally speaking, they should be aligned. So if I put the natural pins towards the resonators, towards me as the player, then these face the audience. If these face me, here, then these face the audience. So you just see how that works. So the motor drives the orange belt, and then that drives these. And that's how the, the wings are going to operate. And you'll see that in a few minutes. Next thing we're going to do is to install the resonators. Uh, you don't have to get them from underneath the way you do on a lot of instruments. They're pretty easy to install. These are the sharps. And I'm just going to set them in from the top down like this. It's only one way they can really go in. There's uh, little felt pads and so forth. You might have to spread the two things here and just drop it in. Those are in. And then the naturals go in like this. Same way. Just from the top down. You know, I'm trying not to scratch your instrument, but uh, basically they go in there and then they drop here. I might have to spread the, the two rails there just a little tiny bit to get them to go in, and they're installed. That's all there is to it. Um, I mentioned these uh, earlier. If you're a very heavy player, you want to probably keep these in so that the vibrato wings can't actually touch the resonators. If you're a normal uh, player, or I shouldn't say normal player, but uh, not a super hard player, you can just pull these out. They're just forced in there. Okay, the little plastic, uh, slippery polyethylene uh, props there. This is the tuning stick that comes with the instrument, and this will help you get back to 
a resonator setting that will be perfect for about 70 degrees normal room temperature. If you do some experimentation with the resonator plugs or you tune up for particular weather conditions and then you have a question about where the plug should be for normal 70 degree weather, this tuning stick will get you back to it. So we're just going to do the F sharp here first. I put it down in the tube and you can see that the F sharp line is just peeking up at the top of the tube and there's the G sharp line and then there's the A sharp line. So these are perfectly tuned for 70 degrees. The important thing to realize is that in uh, weather conditions, as the room gets hot, as the air gets hot, the tubes go sharp very, very quickly, and they go out of tune with the bars, which are going flat slowly in that heat. In cold weather, the opposite thing happens, and the tubes go flat and the bars go sharp. So you have to really find an equilibrium to get the best sound out of the instrument so it meets your taste. You have to have tunable resonators, and that's why we have tunable resonators. This is, the uh, stick is included so that you can get back to a sensible setting at 70 degrees if you get lost. And all I can say is that once you start to use these to compensate for temperature, you'll wonder how you live without them because they're really essential tools for a professional vibraphone player. You can adjust the ring time, more ring time, less ring time, more volume, less volume, all through the resonator tuners that we showed you earlier in this presentation. Next, we're going to install the wings onto the vibrato system, assuming that you bought an instrument with a motor, um, and uh, in which case you got the wings and you got the motor. If you didn't, if you bought an Omina, then it's coming without vibrato. But first thing is, it says peel off the plastic. That's that white stuff. Peel that off, and then you'll have a nice glossy black finish. Now, um, there's a, a hole here with a little plastic bushing on one side, and then up here you'll have a slot. The slot is the high side, the narrow portion, because the resonators on the high end are, of course, smaller than the resonators on the low end, so it's pretty obvious which way it goes on. Can't really mess it up. But all I have to do is align that little bushing with the pin on the sharps. Doesn't matter what position these arms are in, just because they move together. So you just get it aligned, you push it down, and then this side drops into the slot. Ditto for the naturals, or in reverse order, it doesn't matter. I just align that with the hole, and I push it down onto the bushing. Over here, I drop it into the slot, and now they're installed. Now, if I manually move them, you can see that they're moving together. They're, now they're totally open, and now they're covering a portion of the tube. You can get these wings in bigger or smaller versions. We ship with a medium-sized wing. If you would like a very deep vibrato effect, we can send you a wider one. If you want even a more mild effect in vibrato, we can, we can send a narrower one. Totally up to you. Next thing is we have to hook up the motor. So I'll just move this out of the way. And incidentally, with a little practice turning on and off the instrument, you can very quickly learn how to stop the wings in the totally open position, in the half-closed position, in full-closed position. It's just a matter of when you flip the switch. So next thing is we've got to attach the motor power supply, and we just take a scissor, cut it out of the bag, and here we have the power supply. And I'm going to clip this here to get the cord, and then I'm going to plug it into the wall, and this little plug goes in right next to the low F resonator. There's a, a, a receptacle for the power supply that goes into the control box. You can't see the control box because it's all mounted inside underneath this, but I, you can take my word for it. Where it gets plugged in is over here. So I just look over there and you'll see it right away. It's right underneath this spot right here. And now I just plug this into the wall and then I'll have power and we'll show you that in just a moment. Um, so, next thing I want to show you is just the power on and off switch. We've plugged into a wall outlet. If I turn the switch on, I wanted to show this to you before we put the bars on. And again, we've got the plastic covers on here. We'll peel those off. But that's how the vibrato works. Now, notice it's not going just straight in and straight out. It's not turning like a traditional one, which gives you sort of an arithmetic, exactly the same 
kind of opening and closing. What's happening here, the reason I think so many people love the sound of this is it's easing into the tube and then eases out. So it's a little bit more of an analog kind of sound to the vibrato. So that's the way it is. And of course, you can adjust the speed here. Just want to show you that these support mechanisms here really don't touch the wing. The wing is only touched here at that bushing and then over here in the slot. Those are the only places that, that touch. This is for if it's a really hard play or really, really bashing uh, the instrument. If the wing flexes, it's going to touch here and it'll be much quieter and it won't really ever touch the resonators. And likewise up here on the skinnier end where you might get a little bit of flexibility if you're playing really, really hard and loud, the wing is going to come down and it's going to touch that plastic piece and it's not going to touch the resonator so it'll be quiet under all playing circumstances. That's it. Here's your speed control. And as I mentioned, it's very easy to stop in the open position. It's easy to stop in the closed position or halfway between. Just with a tiny bit of practice, you can, you can figure out at slow speed or fast speed how to stop it in the full open for maximum volume. sharps, we're going to do the same thing. Make sure you have the pedal adjusted so that you can take all the pressure off the damper bar. Just stand on the pedal. Get it started into the end posts. And as you unroll it, if you rolled it up properly, you should be able to unroll this and lift and pull. Lift and pull. I'm going to transfer get my right foot on the pedal. Lift and pull. You put as much tension on it as you can because if you do it right, you'll end up like that, the bars will be almost in position. Now when the instrument's new, it won't go so well because this, the keyboard will be packed up on a table, not off of an instrument, but then just get, again, get the string around the end posts here, and then feed the bars in to the captive bar posts, and just like that, in, good, in, like that, in, like that, Move over here, switch feet. In. That one's in. And these two are in. Whoops, two more missing. I think that's it. Whoops, one missing. Now that's in. Let the pedal up. We're done. Just a word about dampening. Uh, we talked about the springs before. If you want to adjust to get more dampening on the high end, what I would do would be to tighten the spring tower here. And I would turn it clockwise this way from underneath. If I was looking from the bottom up, I would go clockwise to tighten. If I want to get more dampening on the low end, of course, I'd reach in from over here into that spring tower, very easy to reach. Okay, right there, I would tighten that one if I want more dampening this way. 
And the test for that should be regulated in our final inspection, but you never know in trial you might get it off a little bit. We want to make sure that those two notes and those two notes are both released at the same time, which they are. They're, they're dampening at the same time, so this is well regulated. Likewise, sharps and naturals, you want to make sure that those also come off at the same speed, and they are. If I wanted to adjust that, then just over here, this is our patented reson uh, not resonator <laughs> adjustment, it's a dampening adjustment. If I tighten this, it takes the damper bar and tilts it down to favor the sharps. If I loosen it against the springs, it tilts the damper bar this way to, to uh, dampen the naturals a little sooner. So this knob and that knob, you can adjust each quadrant separately to get perfect dampening. Here's a little bit more information about adjusting the dampening system. We talked earlier about how the two spring towers can adjust the high to low range. And we talked a little bit how this dial over here and this dial over here can adjust the angle of the damper bar in our patented system to compensate and give more quick dampening on the sharps or more quick dampening on the naturals. But suppose you have one note. Suppose the D sharp is ringing a little bit too long, and all the other notes are fine. Well, go into your repair kit, open it up, and you have two different kinds of shims here. Very useful little repair kit. There's some other nuts and bolts and other things that you might have used for at some point. A wrench for tightening the resonators, etc. But here we've got two types of shims. This felt, of course, you can use anywhere. Can't imagine that you would get a rattle, but you can use that to dampen something. And then this is polyethylene tape. So what I could do would be this cover on the damper bar is just Velcroed underneath. So I can peel back the black cover, peel it back, and then if this D-sharp is ringing too long, I could peel off the backing here and put this little shim underneath where the D-sharp would touch the gel pad. And that's only about ten thousandths of an inch thick, but you'd be amazed what ten thousandths of an inch thick will do. This is more like about forty thousandths of an inch. So between those two, I could shim up the damper pad a little bit higher here to make that D-sharp dampen sooner. So, one more little point here in terms of your own maintenance. We have a spring here. What's that for? Well, that's of course to keep pressure on the string. How tight should the string be? Well, it's always a trade-off because here's the situation that the tighter the string is, you might get a little bit more bar ring, but you also might get a little bit more noise out of the frame, or it's possible with certain types of cord that you would actually get some buzzing. Now, we supply a very quiet cord that really shouldn't buzz at all, but you should still have tension here so the bar doesn't sag down and perhaps touch the wing. This is about how I think you'd want it, with at least that much tension. This one, if you look at this spring, this is too loose. There really isn't any tension on this. So how would I tighten that? Well, I take it off the end post, I loosen the, uh, the knot, and I'll pull it closer to the, to the side there, pull the knot tight again, and then go around the bar post, and now I've got quite a bit more tension. And the strings, you can just leave like that, you can cut off, whatever you want to do. But now I have pretty much the same tension on those two springs. Uh, just one last thing, we're set up now, everything except for taking off the film on the wings, but you can see we've got a very solid instrument, there's no sound from pounding the frame. I don't have the pedal adjusted precisely here because it's uh, just from putting on the bars, but just should have very silent vibrato.
So thanks very much for listening. Uh, I hope that you learned a lot from this and that uh, you're going to be a very happy owner of an Omega Buy. If there's something that I haven't explained properly, if I've confused you or whatever, check the website. There might be additional information posted there since we made this particular video. Or call our customer service at 732-774-0011. All of the online stuff is posted at mostlymarimba.com. Again, welcome to the Malatech Owners Club, and I hope you really enjoy your Omega Vibe.